You guys take the aminos every day. I take the aminos every single day. You're like Charlie in the yeah. chocolate yeah. factory <laughs> of amino acids. Why are women so scared of creatine? Is creatine legit or not? They were able to cite like a hundred studies. What are the things that you've seen that have stayed consistent? Like that really works mm -hmm. as I age? When you age, all those things get harder. So it becomes more and more beneficial the older you get. I don't mean to get too nerdy, but it's like where you're, yeah. your yeah, heart- nerdy. Like, no, no, we love nerdy. What are some things that you see on social media that you think are misinformation when it comes to wellness? Go off. This blew my mind when I when I read this. Damn, that's a great tip. I live on your aminos ever since we talked. And I was looking at the last time you came on. For those of you guys that miss Angelo's on the show again, and his last time you were here was in 2022. And people need to go back and listen to that episode because we basically started it with you telling a story about getting stabbed on acid. So hopefully you've leveled that up now, maybe even shot or something. How are you uh, going to top being yeah. stabbed on acid? I want to know all the demons in your closet. How are you going to top being but stabbed Angelo, on acid? But he also has one of our favorite brands that we use every single day in the gym, at home, and that is key on the coffee. We use the aminos, we use the creatine, like so many things. So welcome back. Welcome to the Skinny Confidential. That's all I got. I don't know what else I can do. That's to, pretty good, though. To top the, that was uh, good. You topped it. I tried. You I mean, I, I, I do what I can do. Okay. Might have to use that in one of our intros. Maybe we'll update the intro. You know what that sounds like? Michael's alarm in the morning when he wakes up. <laughs> Michael, for some reason, thinks that he has to wake up to the most annoying alarm on the planet. Not that you're annoying, but it's a little jarring when I'm sleeping. You know what I mean? Yep. That's how he wakes up. I need I, uh, the same thing, Michael. So I, I feel I'm I feel actually going to pull that clip of you doing that. And that's going to be the new alarm. So I've Get never seen anything like this motherfucker in the morning. It is like it's it's almost like Larry David esque the way he wakes up. I will be in a blissful sleep with all my stuff, like my weighted blanket, like just so calm. And he will wake up like everything. It's like Ichabod Crane. He accidentally <laughs> bumps his elbow. Ow, shit. Damn it. Fuck. <laughs> Like, it's just so, I'm just like, shut up. Is this for real? Okay, let me tell you something. And then we're going to get into the episode. Lauren does this thing where she really obviously cares about, I guess, the aesthetic of the house. Who doesn't? But at the sacrifice of function sometimes. And she has all Who of doesn't? these. <laughs> she has a squatty potty that is clear. She has an invisible tray, like a tray that you use in bed that is clear. So I'm in the middle That's of the night. And you the trip dark, on everything. And I smash into these clear things <laughs> that you can't see. And of course, I'm like, you know, yeah, of course. Okay. Well, he he's making his mango Keanu <laughs> aminos with some creatine mixed in. So I can hear that too every morning. Is mango the best flavor? According to you guys, I, that's what I remember from last time. Although flavor has been one of those things in building a business that is maybe the most sh like surprising to me. The degree to which someone is so confident that this is the best flavor and the other one like is terrible and sucks. And people be on all sides. People swear by watermelon, swear by berry, swear by lime. You guys are the mango crowd, which I think is probably the best. Yeah. I you guys, that's probably the best. Those are the I best know. key it on the users. Best. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I love all the flavors. Watermelon's my second, but mango, the, I've now associated mango with my workout because I use a scoop with mixed with creatine every single day, frothed up. It has to be with a frother. You told me no. I love it with a frother. <laughs> <laughs> in my cold cup with ice. And, but I've associated this with the workout. So it's like my brain wants that. I love that. That is for <laughs> real. That is a great routine. But for real, like taking it before you work out, some people take it afterwards, which is also good. But before you work out is it's um, not only is it good for motivation and for like having the energy and the endurance during the exercise, you actually get the most benefits from it, from the exercise itself. Why so, are women so scared of creatine? Why are women so scared of creatine? Because their boyfriends in high school and college took it. Yeah, they and were, they, they got everything. all swole. Yeah. And they talked about how swole they were getting. Yeah. And it's like, ah, I don't want to have any, I don't want to get like that or whatever they <laughs> thought those guys were were getting. So I think it's, you know, you get exposed to an idea at some point and it's pretty hard to shake it sometimes. It's unfortunate though, because creatine is a, it's a really cool ingredient and supplement that is especially beneficial for women. Creatine's changed my life. I, and I feel like you're the perfect person to ask. I think it's really helped me put on muscle, but stay lean at the same time. I was in a journey of losing 60 pounds. And one of the, like one of the things in my toolbox is creatine. What, what do you see creatine doing for women? So, I mean, just quick signs of what creatine Love is. It. It's actually a unique energy source. So we think about like carbohydrates and fat as being things that we burn in our body, but there's an even more immediate source of energy 
at the level of our cells that we use for doing like really intense uh, exercise. And that could be like lifting weights or pushing through really hard, like on a sprint or something like that. And that's actually the uh, phosphocreatine system in the cells. So it's what gives you bursts of energy. So when you consume creatine on a daily basis, which by the way, that's the most important thing. People may say you need to consume it at like before or after work. It doesn't matter. Just take it every day. If you take it every day, it saturates your cells. And then what happens is when you need boosts of energy to like pick up something heavy to, um, to run really fast, or even what we're finding is for cognition, it actually improves cognitive function because it's supporting at the cellular level, like these very really quick uh, active bursts of energy. So when I say it's really important for women, the reason for that is it's important for everyone, but oftentimes women consume less of the whole food sources of creatine, which are things like beef, like beef has a lot of creatine. There's really no plant-based uh, foods that have creatine in them. It's almost all animal-based and it's things like steak. So uh, for women who's, whose diets tend to include less of that than their bro boyfriends from high school that ate tons of beef, uh, it's a great solution to try to hit that, that core need for that nutrient without having to like change their whole diet. I want to go back with you in a second, but staying on the creatine cognition for a second, I think everyone focuses on the physical benefits, but to your point, I think there's a lot coming out about the benefits from a cognition standpoint from creatine. And I, I, we were listening to somebody talk the other day who suffers from migraines and they were saying that one of their doctors told them if they have a really poor night of sleep, instead of mm -hmm. supplementing with the typical like five grams of creatine to maybe go to like 10 to 15 the day after, after you've had a shitty night of sleep and supplement that way. And that can help negate some of the effects of that poor night of sleep. Do you, do you find that to be truthful in any way? There is science that's, that specifically speaks to the benefits of creatine related to sleep. I think we're still kind of unclear on exactly like how and why it does it, but bottom line, it improves people's sleep. And that is a great example of um, helping to recover after a poor night of sleep as well. Okay. So this is your second time on the show. And I was looking, you haven't been on since 2022. It was a phenomenal episode. I think for anyone that missed it, it's episode 507. It's called the missing ingredient to losing weight and building lean muscle. It's relevant for, for everybody. And it's a great episode. Um, but for those that don't know you and haven't listened, maybe just a little context on you and then we'll dive in. So I was raised in a super health focused family. My parents were actually like in the supplement business in the seventies, then had a natural health food store, natural health food restaurant. I was born at home, uh, never got a haircut till I was nine, never didn't get a birth certificate till I was like seven. So they were like some pretty crunchy hippies from outside Austin. So I was raised in that environment, got exposed to supplements really early. My parents actually gave me amino acids as a kid. They were the ones that started the term "Keep Austin Weird." They were. Uh, they, were that yeah, they were probably someone probably looked at my dad and, and was so like, well, "Do more of whatever that thing is." Yeah. This gigantic uh, hair and huge beard, etc. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, so I was just like raised in a culture of valuing supplements, valuing amino acids, and my parents actually specifically had made the choice to be pescatarians. And this is I'm I just turned forty, so this is in the eighties. And with that decision, though, they knew a lot about protein nutrition. So when, on days when we didn't eat fish, they talked a lot about combining different plant proteins to make sure that we got all of the essential amino acids in our diet so that we could be healthy and thrive, et cetera. So I basically like had that background, story went into depth last time, kind of got into a lot of trouble, exciting story about getting stabbed on acid, recovering from that, kind of refinding my, not refining, you know, you get raised in a certain culture and environment, a faith, you may say, of like what is important and what the people around you value. And at some point you have to like actually figure out what you believe. And that was a very distinct moment for me at 16. And from that moment on, I was super into health, like not because my parents were, but because not just because I was into sports, but like I really wanted to think about what I ate what kind of exercise I did, whatever kind of alternative modalities might work. And, and again, that's when like, I got really into whey protein at that point in time, but also into amino acids. And that just kickstarted like a journey of, of health. And, you know, fast forward to 2017. And I finally had, I think, the business background, the experience. I'd lived overseas for several years, done a lot of different businesses and felt, you know, confident and ready to. I had tried to do my own thing, but like really tried to do my own thing now. And I really just came back to my roots about like what was most important to me. And that was health and nutrition and products that like I can really stand behind. And you guys take the aminos every day. I take the aminos like every single day. You can give them to your kids, right? 
Yeah, I give them to my kids. You so you mentioned your parents gave them to you like in a pill form. Like what kind of form was it? Uh, it was a pill and like a liquid form. Okay, so we so I give Zaza, I call it candy water, and I'll give her uh-huh. mango aminos. That's fine. That's fine. Like a scoop a day? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I mean, I think it all depends on your unique child. Whenever you're talking about kids, my it's child's like, like minerals, <laughs> minerals, minerals, D3. I want blue. I want yellow. That's, that means B12. They're, they want, uh, a co- we have cookie well, they, water, candy water, water, watermelon water. They're all manipulations. Like the watermelon water is colostrum. The candy water is mango aminos. Then we have, we have a cookie water is electrolytes. I think like, you know, you, you know this as a parent and I think it's very difficult to get your kids to do certain things, but they, they model what you do. And I think mm-hmm. they've, they've seen us doing these kind of things. And so they get curious and, you know, so I think like, I guess the parenting tip from my perspective, I'm always hesitant to give parenting tips, right? Is that if you want the kids to do more of these healthy things, they have to see you start doing those healthy things. And is that more how it arises for you guys? It's not like here, do this. They, they see you doing it and they kind of want to participate in the routine with you. I use creative branding a lot. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So like saying like calling mango aminos candy water, they want the candy water. So, or I'll say like, I'll say like, do you want salty water from the sea? And they like want it. They want like the water where the mermaids live. Yeah, and like, it's uh-huh. minerals. Like I'll uh-huh. like use creative branding. And I think that wrapping it in a package in a bow like that makes a big difference. Yeah. Like I, I have a very that. specific <laughs> post-workout routine that I've been doing. Uh-huh. And I've, my son, who's not even two yet, he's part of the process. He like gets the protein <laughs> out and he gets, you know, I use this coconut milk and he, is that what it he is? Got, yeah, he gets your and creatine he gets, he gets out. The crea- he gets all this stuff and we make it together and then he gets a little mini portion of it with me. And it's like something we do, but he looks like he knows he's like smoothie, smoothie. And he knows what that means. And so I think just like teaching them that kind of stuff, because I'd much rather have him have something like that than some like chocolate sugary like fake milk or something. But we're not perfect. Yeah, I know. But I'm not trying to be perfect. My macro take on that would be, I think probably it's great if you give your kids aminos. I give it to my kids. They take whey protein, all the stuff. And I think probably the most potent thing I heard you say, Michael, was that you're doing something with your kid to that degree. We're like, you're doing this positive behavior. He gets to be part of it with you. You guys get to share in it together. I bet that'll have a bigger impact on him long term than- Yeah, he like dumps the protein in there and like Dude. dumps the blueberries. Super in. anal about it. Super, yeah. uh, super. <laughs> the, the tick with this smoothie. I mean, I, let me tell you about this tick. This kid is like smoothie, smoothie. Then he has to put his hand on the smoothie and make the smoothie. If I try to touch the smoothie, he slaps my hand off. It's a whole thing. No, but it's, you're right. It's about making them part of the, they feel like they've got ownership over it. Can, it, can yeah, part of like cool, healthy stuff with you. Creatine too? They can take creatine. I think creatine is something that's like less... So breaking it down a little bit more, I think that the primary benefit of, say, aminos, the the things that aminos helps with the most is for building and maintaining muscle and for basically losing fat, but being able to maintain muscle while you do it, improve the outcomes of exercise. Like, so literally, if you take it before you exercise, you will get a lot more out of the exercise. You'll build and maintain more lean muscle. you'll, You'll burn more fat. You'll recover faster. And similarly, when you age, all those things get harder. So it becomes more and more beneficial the older you get. So if you're talking about a kid, I think that if they're just like fundamentally like not eating that much protein, it's a great extra tool to use because essential amino acids are the thing that you're trying to get from the protein. It's the active component of the protein that provides all the primary benefit for protein synthesis. So if your kid's not eating that much protein, I think it's a great thing to give. I more primarily use it with my kids because they, because they're pretty intense athletes already. Like they're super into exercising and I'm thus like really thoughtful about making sure they get enough protein. Cause I just want to support them and not getting injured and like being healthy, et cetera. Um, and for my daughter who I, she's so much harder to get to eat protein. She like just doesn't, she's just like not as into it. It's like hacks are key on aminos. Another one is like nutritional yeast, like little weird things that for some reason she likes. And I'm like, great. Like that's what do you put nutritional yeast on? I'm hearing all about this. She loves it on rice. Okay. Like I I wouldn't eat it on. It seems weird to me, but she loves it on rice. Uh, You know, I grew up actually eating it on popcorn. I think it's killer on popcorn. The problem is though, how old are your kids? Well, now they're eight and 11. You're not supposed to, apparently, TikTok scared me of giving popcorn to my kids under five. Why? They said it's, yeah. You think I mean, my so? kids ate, 
I don't know. You have to choose. Your, you have to choose all your own risks. Like have, I definitely give my popcorn. kids popcorn when they were little. Maybe kids. I'll give them popcorn with nutritional yeast. TikTok's just a bunch of softies. <laughs> Get your kids popcorn; they'll be fine. What I mean, I mean that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I can't weigh in. I don't know like the statistics on kids getting injured from popcorn. Weigh in. But I'm like, whoa, that seems pretty soft. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> like, right, right. like, dang, man. I'm like, I. I'm definitely trying to encourage my kids to have a bit more resilience <laughs> and a, be a bit tougher than popcorn. How no did offense you, to anyone. How did you as a parent and someone who's so wellness like conscious get your kids into sports? You said they're mm-hmm. really into sports. So I think overall, like my approach to parenting is not, I'm not trying to get my kids to do anything. And I don't have expectations that they need to do or be anything. My primary focus with them is, can they be emotionally and psychologically self-sufficient people? Like when they grow up, can they sense what their own feelings are? Wait, not even when they grow up, like now. Can they generally know what they're feeling, generally know what they want, be able to advocate for it, but also be sensitive enough to other people to like understand like what they're needing, what I'm needing, what their friends are needing, et cetera. And if they have those skills, then generally they'll be able to sort through life. They'll be able to choose things. They'll be able to deal with resistance, like they start getting interested in something and they get kind of bored. They'll be able to name like, I like this, but I'm also kind of bored and I don't want to work on it. And then we can talk through it and they can keep progressing. So I think with that focus, I then just talk to my kids, you know, invite them to try things, challenge them to do stuff. And then when they start to get into something, if they really seem like they're into it, I do everything I can to participate in it with them. So for example, my son started to kind of get into basketball when he was like, I don't know, seven, eight. And so I got into it. I went and I became the assistant coach and I would be part of the group with him and be there to support him and be interested. And as he got more and more, I'd wake up in the morning and be like, hey, do you want to practice? He'd be like, sure. So I would practice with him every morning for 10 Aww. minutes. And then I'd be like, do you want to do more? And he's like, I'd love to go on a father-son trip. So I like took him to, there's this guy, uh, Mike, I'm forgetting his last name. He's like a big NBA trainer. We went to Michigan for like a week when he's like eight or something and did like this intensive Sweet. basketball thing. So I just jumped in it with him. And in that journey, there's been times when he was like, it was hard or he didn't want to do it. But I think his passion for it continued to get nurtured. And the fact that I was doing it with him, he just like kind of kept growing at it. Whereas it's different for my daughter. She got into gymnastics. It's, you weren't doing cartwheels? Well, well, it's funny though. I like, I did. I, I, <laughs> I signed up for parkour with her. So I can do, because gymnastics is super exclusive of dads. Like you can't like get involved or like help. So you I can't can, put the leotard on and start doing some flips. No, no, oh. they won't let you. I tried. I got, I got put on the leotard, showed up for practice, everything. No, but I did sign up for uh, like a parkour thing and I learned how to do a cartwheel. So I actually know, I never knew how to do a cartwheel and I learned how to do a cartwheel at 39. That would be a sight to see, Angelo. I'd yeah. like to see a video of that. Do one right now. Go, to, <laughs> go through the camera. Okay. So I guess in summary, it's like, be focused overall. I'm trying to fo- be focused overall on my children's general sense of self and self and sense of others, and then just invite them to do stuff and then be there with them and like do it. I think that's great advice. And then they're going to figure out the stuff they're into. And like most kids, I think being in your body is pretty cool. It's really cute that you're this involved when you're running such a big company because it's a lot of work what you're doing, what you're building. It's like there's a lot of sacrifice that goes into it. And it's inspiring for me to hear as someone who wants to build my own empire. And it's like, how do you sort of do it all, but do it well? I think about that a lot. I actually think about that more than I even talk to you about. How do you do it all, do it well? I don't know that there's such thing as balance, but really show up and be present in it. I mean, I think that in the essence of what you said, do it all. I might just challenge that. I don't think you can do it all. Right. So you you really have to choose. You have to almost like yeah, like I'm not at like friends' birthdays. Viciously on a choose. Yeah, like yeah. you're just and like yeah. basically the only thing I do is key on and my family. Yeah. Like that's the only thing I do, and then I find ways of integrating pieces of it together. So for example, I mean, like I'll go, I'll still go do like intensive basketball stuff with my son. Like for me to do an intensive basketball training for two hours, that's like pretty intense exercise and coordination and skill development. And I didn't like play high school or college basketball, so it's a challenge to me, but it's like, I'm getting exercise and I'm with my son doing this thing, but I don't, I don't do anything else. And I think even with my kids and with my family, it's like, don't be on my phone. Don't be doing other distracting things. Like don't like either be working and building the company or connecting with my daughter, my son, or my wife. Yeah. So you don't let it bleed over. So I've got four things. I only have four things to do in life. 
That's good advice. I'm, I'm glad you're going to start taking it, Lord. <laughs> Anyways. Um, <laughs> I was looking at you. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, it's funny because in that similar vein, I think you're 100% right. You can have it all. And sometimes we will get pressure from friends or people that want to, you know, do things socially. And I think every parent listening recognize like, you know, it's so hard when you have young kids to get out and be social. You just can't. And work. And so what we've, what I try to articulate is we are fortunate that we've kind of built our life around even like doing stuff like this. So like I get to socialize with you for an hour and whoever else comes on the show, like that's my social time. It's hard then for me to like later and say, okay, I'm going to be going to three dinners and this, I, I don't do that, but this is, this is enough. And then you build the stuff around it. You know what I mean? I, I connect with that. And I think that's, I used to fight that more and be like, I want to, you know, get to go do these things with my friends or, um, I was a musician for a lot of my life. Like, I, I'm not even an artist or musician now. I'm just like a business guy. You know, it's almost like I want that opportunity to express myself in that way. And it, it hasn't, I haven't had the space. But what's weird is I think if you're focused enough and patient enough, it comes back around. 100%. I, so too. I just started doing voice lessons with my daughter. So now we do voice lessons once a week. And so it's like, I'm getting to do, I mean, it's not like I'm getting like playing a band or something, but it's pretty cool. I'm getting yep. to challenge myself and grow. And so similarly, I think you can like, in the way that this can be social, as your kids get a little bit older, they can do things that are like a bit more. Because how old's your eldest? She's four. Four. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, it's still pretty hard. Four and two, it's like. We're in it. It's still pretty baby. We're, we're it's in it. still pretty baby. Once, <laughs> but like once you get to like eight and six, like a lot more opens up in terms of other ways that you can express yourself, pursue interests, just like I think leaning into them. I feel like you have to like what you said, it's like manipulate the situation to work for you. Like, for instance, like if if we are going to go to dinner with someone, how can we integrate the kids in it? Like, uh -huh. can, can they bring their kids? Or if you're going to go on a vacation, how can you make it like family? Like you really have to like make it work for the family or the business is, is what I'm learning. What you said, you can't do it all. It can work in little pockets if you sort of manipulate the situation. No, Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think especially if it's like those two things are your focus. Yeah. Like you want to be an awesome mom, yeah. wife, and business businesswoman, like then you can probably try to craft things together and find little shared wins. Yeah. Like I know this sounds maybe fucked up in a way, but like in this moment in our lives, I think we want to be awesome parents and, you know, you know, in a great relationship and then be great business people. And that means sometimes we're sacrificing right now friendships. But I think our real friends will understand, okay, they're in it with two kids under four and doing these things. And the ones that don't get it, it's like, I, I don't have time to convince them. Speaking of age, you mentioned you just turned 40. Not to, mm -hmm. not to call, not to- I, to, I don't mind. I, I like no, no, it. I mean, it 40, 40, 40 is the new 20, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason I bring it up to you is you've been around- health and wellness and fitness for so long. You've also seen behind the curtains, building a company like you've built. You've seen all the, the things that are fads, the things that are trends, the things that really stick in your 40 years and being so focused on this space. What are the things that you've seen that, you've seen that have stayed consistent? Like that really works mm -hmm. as I age. And what are the things you're like, okay, like that was not so important. There's a lot of young people, I think like, what are the, what are the things that really work? The things that actually matter. Yeah. I think that a couple of things stand out. One is that consistency and adherence is more important than whatever new fad comes out. New information come out on Instagram today where it's like, you need to do ex exactly this many reps of this thing, or you can't eat this food anymore. You got to do this or do that. If you just consistently every day continue to show up and you try to eat quality whole foods and not eat, st eat stuff that's like obviously highly processed and not that nutritive. Like if you're eating stuff like tons of cookies, like there's not, you know, you know, there's not really protein. Like, you know, you know what's in it. Right. And you generally every day find some way to exercise and move your body. And whether that's like, you know, I think resistance training is great. I do some cardio. Maybe you just love cardio though. I would say doing whatever that form of running is or whatever you like every single day or every other day and being sticking with it is much better than trying to jump from thing to thing and start and stop and like not actually get anywhere. And I think a lot of the industry and marketing and consumers relationship to it is like just try, like jumping around and trying all these different things. And it's, if you just stick with like good, solid, consistent stuff, like it will, it will work out. So, but I know your question was more like, what is that stuff? I do think it's pretty simple. I think it's like simple resistance training, push pull type workouts, some type of like uh, low 
moderate level activity, like zone two. I don't mean to get too nerdy, but it's like where you're, yeah. you're hey, nerdy. Like, no, we, no, we love nerdy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean like zone two exercise where you're basically, you're jogging or riding a bike or doing something. You can be like speed walking or ruck, rucking to such a degree that like your heart rate's up, but, to, and you, we wouldn't really want to hold a conversation, but you could like doing that during the week. Um, and, and then basically like, if you can get some kind of like sprinting, running hard, but that like for me, I do Muay Thai. So I like kickboxing. I'm never going to run that fast on my own. I just like, someone's going to have to make me do it. Sure, but <laughs> right? Muay Thai is like a bunch yeah. of spurts of intense energy. Yeah, it's like spurts of intense energy because all these things are different. Like lifting heavy things is one body system. Mm -hmm. Your heart being able to be at an elevated level, but not too elevated for an extended amount of time is another way that your body needs to train. Being able to sprint is another type of body training. Like those, like even just one or two of those each, each of those per week will make a huge difference if you just kind of, if you start doing those. But if you really only like one, just do one. Like you don't have to do them all. And then on the food basis, it's like, it really is like getting in enough protein every day and then eating, I think, fruits and vegetables and- But you base it around the protein first. I think protein and, I think protein and vegetables and fruits, because vegetables and fruits do have a lot of really important micronutrients that- not all protein does. But when you get down to like all the other foods you're going to eat, I mean, you don't like need to, I don't think you need to have whole grains. I mean, if you like whole grains, great, eat them. You don't like need to have tons of these other fats. I mean, you'll get these things with, like if you eat vegetables and fruits and quality protein, animal protein, you're going to be pretty healthy and then just kind of fill in the edges. So I think it really can be that simple. And, you know, research about other types of supplements and products come out and there are specific impacts as we age that like change those things. And protein actually is one of them. As like we what? Get, yeah, give me a Yeah, so yeah. as we get older, as we get older, our ability to digest protein and get the essential amino acids out of it, and then for that to actually communicate to our body to build new proteins. which that, So that's the essence of what amino acids are and do. They're the thing in protein that when we eat it, it helps us rebuild the proteins in our body. And the reason why that's important is because you eat carbs and fat to be, to be burned as energy. If you imagine your house, you imagine your uh, body's like a house and you need to get natural gas or electricity from the electric grid to like fuel your lights, to make your lights turn on, run the dishwasher, et cetera. That's what carbs and fat are. But if you actually want to remodel your house, you want to like fix a hole in the wall, you want to redo the kitchen, you want to fix anything physically, all of those parts of your house that are your body are actually proteins your liver, your kidneys, your skin, your hair, your eyes, your uh, hormones, enzymes, muscle, all of this stuff, your nails, all of that is made up of proteins. And they all get old, like even for young people, they start to get old and they break down and you have to replace those proteins. And as you get older, you don't replace them as well. So like, it's if you imagine living in a, in a house and like you haven't been fixed, it's like harder to like keep it maintained and keep repairing things and fixing it. That's what happens to our bodies as we get older. When you take something like essential amino acids, because your body doesn't have to digest it, it's formulated in these very specific ratios. It is so much more effective than protein, which goes back to my point earlier. When you're a kid, it's not quite as important, but like literally gram for gram, if you compare essential amino acids like Keon aminos to beef in a mixed meal, like, so I'm not just saying like eating it alone, but like you eat it with like potatoes and broccoli, it's like 24, 25 times as effective because, you, because you're just getting the pure essential amino acids. So as you get older, the idea of not only eating protein, but like really starting to supplement more, I'd say starting age 30, it makes a lot of sense. That said, the main question we started with was like, what's most important? What do you really need to focus on? I think it's fruits, vegetables, protein. But there are really important supplements like something like essential amino acids that are going to provide a benefit that you can't get from the foods as yeah. you get older. I think like the, and what I was asked, like, for example, like I was having these respiratory issues. So I was like doing a bunch of stuff with NAC, but it was like very specific uh -huh. towards that, just for that yeah. specific issue. And then I'm like, okay, and once that went away, like I'm not doing as much. But I think from like, a, and, and not to go on a tangent there, I think sometimes people look at supplements and they're like throwing the whole kitchen sink at everything. But the things that you do on a consistent yearly, daily basis, I would say, okay, if aminos fall into that, creatines, maybe one of them, maybe some whey proteins or whatever proteins you prefer. Like what, what are the other things that you've said? Okay, these things are like kind of a daily, weekly staple. 
I think that creatine is another great one. Um, so, I mean, honestly, and I'm not trying to now turn this into like a plug. I'm just being real about like my, you make the ones. my, my brand. Like I make the ones. He like, makes they, the ones. You make I the make the ones. Yeah. yeah. And it really is whey protein, like a whey protein isolate. And the reason for that is because it is harder to hit daily protein requirements. And you're looking for ways to use something like a supplement, which protein powder is. It's not, it's not just food. It's, it's a supplement that, but you can use in more like food like ways. Like you can put protein powder into pancakes for your kids. I do that. You can put protein powder into baked goods. You can make like, I can make like our chocolate protein shake for my kids for dessert. Yeah. And they, and they, I mean, I put milk in there, even put a little cream, whatever. And it's like ice cream for them, but I just got them this protein. That's such a good tip. You do some raw milk with your chocolate protein. I mean, like, you know, damn, that's a great tip. It really works. Yeah. Like speaking of fruits, I'm like, okay, I want to get a shitload of blueberries in because I've heard blueberries are Mm -hmm. really good and I feel good on them. And so like, I'll take a bunch of them, like literally like, like half of a full thing of blueberries and put it in with the, with whey protein, with a little bit of coconut milk, with some ice. And then, you know, maybe some creatine or like whatever else I'm feeling, but it's just a way for me to get that extra protein. Kit. Cause even like you said, someone like me, who's focused on protein, like yourself, even if I want to get like 150 grams or so, like that's a lot of, it's a lot of eating and that's a lot of different yeah, things. Yeah. And like food prep. And like, if you want to yeah. eat clean food at home, like cause if you do eat out, you don't know like what orals they cooked with, or you can end up getting a bunch of other calories from that. You're just trying to make your own food. Like yeah, if I can protein get 40, powder is, it's pretty helpful. Yeah. If I can get 40 or 50 grams of protein from a powder and I can drink it down and get the fruits in, it's not like all day. So whey, creatine, aminos, and anything else that we should be getting every day? I think that those are really good places to start. I think, I think colostrum is a great yeah. one. But I think that it's more optional. I would say it's a more optional one. But I think it's, it's a, I make a, we've been making colostrum for years for this specific reason. It is a really good product. What are some things that you see on social media that you think are misinformation when it comes to wellness? I mean, there's just so many. I'm like, what, gosh, Please what's go the- on. You're the perfect person. Well, I think, I think this is like the challenge. Here, here's the biggest thing I'd say. Like, even in the context of this conversation, we have a lot more time and space to go into more nuance if we want to. Okay. But in every answer I give you, I have to summarize things. Oh, please. But I'm saying there's hundreds of studies (laughs) on every single subject, right? So I have to summarize, like even if you take the little quote I said, where like this essential amino acid is 24 to 25 times more than the beef protein. But I need to say- Oh, don't worry, they'll pull it. But I need to say (laughs) it's part of a mixed meal. And it's like, and I have to describe how muscle protein synthesis works, et cetera. Like there's, there's a- Context. There's always context and nuance and the internet loves taking the context. Yeah. Out of so it. there's just no context for things. <laughs> and so I think that being able to decipher what actually has, say, hundreds of studies behind it. And across those hundreds of studies, there are clear overlaps of results. Like, so there's, for example, for creatine. Um, When the ISSN, the International Society of Sports Nutrition, did their big paper on it to say, like, is creatine legit or not? They were able to cite, like, a hundred studies. I would say for colostrum, there's not as many studies as that. Okay. Point blank. There just aren't. That doesn't mean it's not good or not legit. It it is. Like, I believe in colostrum. There's really good studies. That's why we make a colostrum product. I love colostrum. But with creatine, like, hundreds of studies and a lot of clarity. But on social media, someone may pick out one study and say this one thing in this really strong way and act like it's like just the fundamental truth. And really, it's what one study uncovered in this one population group and kind of- uh, Clickbait. Yeah. So I think, I, think the, I think the challenge with social media is you, like, w- w- you're hearing all these things. How weighty are the things? Like how, <laughs> how much research is really behind this thing versus that thing? Were there other studies that said something different? You know, like how do you kind of sort through it all? And so I think that's the greatest challenge because it's not so much that like tons of people are out there like lying, right? Or just saying things that are totally false. But I think they're isolating one study and one claim from that study to say something, you know, just like really groundbreaking. So, you know, uh, from my perspective, in someone who's actually trying to bring the most science-backed products, which, for example, when the ISSN did their report on essential amino acids, there were more studies than creatine that they referenced, like 127 studies. Like that's a that's a lot of studies. So when they when they make when they kind of summarize the information, you can trust that um, they weren't cherry picking. Yeah. They're really trying to like build a complete picture for people to understand. What, what from your opinion though? What is what is things that like it could be a it doesn't have to be necessarily case studies, just something that you see on social media from your opinion. 
from my opinion. Yeah. So I think the idea of fasting as increasing longevity, most of those studies and the studies that are referenced are rodent studies. What's a rodent study? Rats. Rats. On rodents. Yeah, they're rat studies. So they're studying they're, they're, the fasting they're, they're on fa the rats. They're studying fasting on rats. And then they're hmm. building this huge, gigantic um, story about it, right? And you have all these influencers talking about it. And you even have, I'm not going to call anyone out who's like more people written books on it, et cetera. But you're talking about rodent studies. And um, I think that to encourage people to make such a big change in their life, say to, to not eat for 12 hours a day, I think, or even more, 16 hours a day. I, I think 12 hours a day is probably not that big of a deal, but it's, or even like 20 hours a day or only eat one meal a day. Um, not that I think that there's anything wrong with making that decision to do that, but to market to people like this is absolutely the thing and it's going to like make you live so much longer and all this. When there's all these other human studies that show that other things are potentially more important, just seems like a weird use of your time. Like you why, why would you build, why would you like promote all these things that are based off like rat studies? My, my big issue with a lot of this stuff and documentaries and even people listening to podcasts and getting this is they, this is going to sound strange. They get out of their own intuition and they're like, okay, I'm now I'm following a very specific plan. But every, like all four of us in this room, our producer, like we're all different and our bodies are different. Mm -hmm. And the way that we're going to, um, need nutrients and supplements are going to be different depending on what we're doing. So for example, if I'm like weight training my ass off every single day and training really hard, I'm not going to be able to fast in the morning. I'm going to need those, that fuel in my body where if some days I'm like, Hey, like I'm not feeling well and I kind of want to give my system a break, like maybe that's more relevant, but people get so stuck on like, this is my routine and my regimen. And I'm going to block out what my body is and mind is telling me. And I'm just going to follow this. I think we're really good at doing that, especially as humans. And it's essentially what I'm saying is we just stop listening to our bodies and we get out of touch with ourselves. Like I eat when I'm hungry and I stop when I feel a little full. I don't, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. That, and what a novel concept. I'm not saying I'm so, but I think a lot of people like it, they will kind of say like, no, I'm supposed to do this specific thing with these specific calories at this specific time or not. And like, that's what they do. They don't, and they get out of like basically being in touch with themselves. And I think like, Lauren, I think you were still trying to push me to say like, what's a specific thing that's like, bullshit but it's it's this it's this thing i think it's the same element of like people acting as if there's like this one absolute truth from like these very simplistic studies maybe it's like rodent studies then persuading this whole group to like change their whole life to live in this whole way according to it and then people like worship that and just try to do that and then they ignore maybe their own intuition like that to me seems like the greatest issue not even so much the specific thing being promoted yeah, I'll give a I'll give a counter example to that. Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with intermittent fasting. Many days, like I won't eat in the morning. I'll take aminos still because I want to maintain muscle and you will lose muscle if you're, you know, not eating for that period of time. But I'm not doing that. Yeah, I'm not doing that with this idea. Like I have to or I must. It's like, hey, it's like I feel kind of clear minded. I'm not really that hungry yet. It's going to overall help my total daily caloric intake. Um it's positive for me. Like there's nothing super negative about it. But when someone's like worshiping like this truth that this is what the science said, but it's like this one guy said it and pulled it from these very selected studies. Like that's the thing that concerns me because I don't want to go and critique anything. I'm not critiquing intermittent fasting. I also think I, like it depends approach. like the gender too. Like uh -huh. with intermittent fasting, like I know I've heard many things where it says like sometimes it's better for men than women because of hormones. I think it's so true that people will make these statements or these proclamations that are there's so much or it, they're so aggressive about it that you you're right it's it's it, there's nuances people there's get, nuances yeah and people get really defensive and really crazy about these kind of topics around diet because i think it hits like people's ways of life you know mm -hmm. and, and and how they think about themselves but for example and i'm not going to pick on a specific diet but if you choose like one certain kind of diet and you think this is what's good for you and everyone else around you is telling you you're watching all these documentaries confirming that bias and then a few months into the diet your hair starts falling out and you ignore that signal from your body like that's an issue right like you can't be like well this is happening because of eight other reasons you have to honestly look at yourself and be like wait is something i'm doing really not as productive as i thought it was right and i just think that we're really good especially when it comes to health and fitness at saying like i am this thing labeling myself in a specific way. You see it with the carnivore people. You see it with the veg. You see it with the, you see all these who they label themselves. They call themselves this thing. 
and then they ignore what's actually going on with the results they're they're getting individually because they've they've attached that label to themselves. I think that's really dangerous. You know, like if you as soon as you make a way of eating part of your identity, like that that's a, that's a, an issue. Man, the way you phrase that, I think it really hit me because I was just thinking about overall diet, how much that reflects people's sense of like how they look, mm -hmm. how they feel, how other people perceive them and how sensitive many of us are regarding that. Like we all want to be validated and approved of. You want to look good if, you know, or you want to be able to perform well or do these things and how diet gets like connected to that. And then you get, and then people get really defensive it's a strange... and super aggressive versus like, what are the foods and the supplements that literally make me feel better, <laughs> right? Yeah. And that then help me live better and potentially help me look better, et cetera. And like that actually being the focus versus all this weird identity. It's like, there's all this other weird it's, emotional it's, it's... content that's going on of that course. doesn't even have to do with the food. Well, it's, it's very like Imagine like I meet someone for the first time or I'm going to a speaking event. And I have to describe who I am. And I'd be like, okay, I'm Michael. I'm a husband, father. Mm -hmm. I like these hobbies. I run these kind of businesses. Like, these are my interests. These are what I do. Like, I wouldn't start this like, hi, I'm Michael. I'm a carnivore. You know what I mean? It's like a strange way to describe yourself. But a lot of people have made their food their primary identifier. And it's a strange thing to lead with, in my opinion. Like, my diet is the thing now that I use as a descriptor to explain myself and my life. Like that is, that is, that, I think people haven't like thought like that. If you're doing that, it's kind of like, well, why, like, why is that your main descriptor? Because that, that just, your food should not be the main thing that lets people know who you are. I, yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, maybe that I, hits, it's, I suddenly felt bad because I was like, oh man, for those people, like what is going on? Like, I know, I guess I would just say for anyone listening and they're in that boat, don't want to be part of like picking on you and making you feel bad about yourself that you're doing that. But it is maybe something curious to ask yourself about. Yeah, let me like give it's, you a, it's an interesting <laughs> thought. Like you're not thinking about, I don't know. The people most important to you, like you're saying a father, right? Or like your active uh, contributions to society as being a businessman and doing these things. It's like all about this one thing that you're putting in your body. Like it's a, it's an interesting prompt or question to ask yourself, like, why are you so not only obsessed with that, but needing to like uh, evangelize other yeah, people on it, et cetera. I'm sure there's going to be people have a certain opinion of what, but I've always... I just, I don't know. I've always found it very strange that people get so bought into a way of eating that they then make it part of their personal identity as their main descriptor. And I think that becomes part of a real issue. Like, who do you actually want to be? And is food controlling your life or are you using it to sustain yourself? Like, I look at food mm -hmm. as a source of like what I need to live and sustain myself as health in as healthy way as possible. I don't look at it as like the thing that drives my life, right? Like I got other shit going on and I want to use the resources as, as food, as, as a resource, not as like a, a thing that determines how I behave every day. I relate to that, man. I think that's, but, how, that's how I think about maybe it. Maybe I walked into a mind what do you, on this yeah. one, but who knows? No, I, I like it. Lauren, what do you think about all this? I think that, that if you are using your food choices as an identity, like if it's linked in your bio, I would ask yourself why. I think that's a good question. And maybe it's a really important part of your identity. And I would still, again, ask myself why. Well, let me or give I would you a also crazy... say, if you're triggered about People, I talk about raw milk all the time. Raw milk mm -hmm. has changed my life and people get so triggered online about it. And I'm like, why do you care what I eat? Like, why do you care? Like, it just triggers people. It's like, why Why does anyone care? And it's really triggering. And I, I think when I'm triggered, I ask myself why I'm triggered as uh -huh. opposed to outwardly blaming other people. But what if I like describe myself, like if you're like, you went to my bio and it said, Whiskey drinker, beer enthusiast, like on the reverse end of it. It's like, that'd be uh, very strange for people to use like that descriptor. You know what I mean? I just, I bet there are people that I'm do sure. that too. And that'd probably I'm again sure. be like a good, maybe, maybe we keep it open-ended. Everyone, how did you describe yourself on your Instagram bio? Yeah. And look at that and see, is that what you want to be the most important things in your life? Is uh, that, is that like. I got to add mom and wife. I, I'm actually curious. I'm going to do a little plot twist about your take on uh, semi-glutide, Ozempic, Wagavi. Uh -huh. what your, what's your vibe on that? Because for me, I think, I think that it could be used as a tool if used properly. But I think the problem is some people are not using it properly because they're losing muscle. Can you, t you're the perfect person to ask this, I feel like. You know what's so interesting is you asked me about this. It had like just come out. I did. We didn't talk about it on the first interview, but right before, like in 2022, you're like, hey, what do you think about this Ozempic thing? I did? And, it, and it was like brand new. Like oh. a, it was like super brand new, but that. we didn't get a chance to talk about it. Okay, and go, go on. So much has happened since then that 
I think now there's way more information and it's a much, we could have a much more fruitful conversation about it. So, it up. Yeah. So I think overall, like big picture, what those drugs do, Ozempic, they, they, they fundamentally help you control your appetite, right? I mean, they do other things, but like people who take them end up eating less. And when you eat less, you, you're going to lose weight because there is just pure science between calories in, calories out. The challenge with caloric restriction diets, and I would just say overall, if you want to lose weight, I would encourage you to eat less calories. Like that is going to be the most fundamental thing you have to do. But when you do that, you have to be very, very thoughtful about how many essential amino acids you're still getting in your diet. And the reason for that is because when you restrict calories, even though protein and the essential amino acids inside of them, their primary role in the body is not to give you energy. Like I described earlier, your body's a house, right? The primary role of protein and amino acids is not to be turned into energy to like turn on the lights and, and to, run, to run the whole house or to move your body. The primary role is to help rebuild the proteins in your body, particularly the muscle. But when you deprive yourself of calories, your body does start using the essential amino acids as an energy source huh. at a way greater rate. And this is gonna blow, I, this blew my mind when I, when I read this. And it's from research uh, from 20, 2020, 2021, that if you go on a 30% caloric deficit, so let's just say that your maintenance calories are uh, like a typical woman, 1,800 calories, and you want to lose weight, you would cut your caloric intake, say, by 600 calories a day. Yeah? And 600 calories a day would have you lose about a pound a week. So if you, if you start eating 30% less food, 30% less calories, you'll lose about a pound a week. But what happens is when you cut your calories by that much, what happens is that there is a three-fold increase. So you need 300% more essential amino acids in your diet wow. in order to maintain your muscle. Wow. To maintain protein balance. Wait, so, so pause there. So if somebody is going and they're doing something like this at a, ca- a caloric deficit and they're going to lose weight, they need to then triple up on their amino intake in order to not lose the muscle at the same rate. But that's yes. not that overwhelming. If they're doing one scoop, they just do three more. Yeah, but, maybe, yeah, just, yeah. but a lot of you, people, I didn't know that even. So. Yeah, but right? I, yeah, it would just be, yeah. I mean, I think if you're using something like essential amino acids already, yeah, it would be like three times the amount. But I, more meat? I, I'm saying in your diet, I'm saying like if before it, you're it, eating it, 100 it. grams of protein. Got it. In the 100 grams of protein, if it's all the highest quality animal protein, probably only 45 grams are essential amino acids because half of protein is essential amino acids. The other of is quality that a good way protein. To look at it if you're, if, yeah, about, but okay. that's like beef, um, milk products. It's not like plant proteins are way less. They're okay. like 20% or something like that. Okay. That would basically mean that you, if you're going to cut calories like that, you would need to go from eating 100 grams of protein to eating 300 grams of protein a day. So you're trying to cut you're trying to cut like um, approximately 600 calories out of your diet. And if it's getting too heady, like we can make it simpler. No, no, but I'm no. trying to cut 600 calories out of my diet, but I need to eat now suddenly go from eating 100 grams of protein to eating 300 grams of protein a day. The reason for that is because if you, if you don't eat that protein, but now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to solve the problem with essential amino acids. Okay. If you don't eat that protein while you're also cutting those calories, so you need to like eat way more protein as a total percentage of your diet than you were before, you will lose muscle while, and not just losing fat. You'll lose a lot of muscle. You can actually lose a pound of muscle at a 750 calorie deficit, whereas wow. you can lose a pound of fat at a 3000 calorie deficit. So overall, what I'm trying to say is you need to eat a lot more protein or you could take a lot more essential amino acids. So the danger Maybe though- fewer. You could take, instead of trying to eat 200 grams more protein, you could just have a few scoops of essential amino acids. But the danger then going back to the Ozempic conversation is if you're going a caloric deficit das- this fast, many people are not aware that they need to increase- Essential. Bio- essential amino acid. Yes. Yeah. And protein. So, and pro- yeah. So they're not, really the fundamental is increasing your essential amino acid consumption. And the way of doing that through whole foods, the way of doing that through through- Protein is through eating whole foods. You know, it could be you could be eating protein powder, et cetera. But so I think that's the issue with these with these drugs in terms of it potentially causing issues for people is it's a very aggressive weight loss based off of intense basic uh, reduction in calories. They're eating way less calories, but they're not changing their overall nutrition. They're not increasing the amount of protein they eat, or they're not adding in essential amino acids as a supplement. And so therefore they're eating away at tons of muscle at the same time. 
And here's the, here's maybe an even bigger issue. And it goes to your question around like losing hair, et cetera. Our hair, our skin, our nails, like all these fundamental parts of our body also come from consuming essential amino acids, from consuming protein. And if you go below the recommended daily allowance, when you're not in a caloric restriction, you will start to have hair loss, skin issues, like really significant problems. So if you're on really aggressive caloric restriction, like you're eating way less, and I'm saying caloric restriction, but really you're taking the drug and then you're just not hungry, hungry. right? So you're not, you're not having to restrict that much. Like the drug's kind of doing it for you. You're suddenly not hungry, you're eating way less, but you're not ensuring that you're even getting these base, this baseline of protein. Not only are you gonna lose muscle, you're gonna have skin issues, hair loss, you're gonna have all these other hosts of issues. And maybe at first you're just so excited that like, you know, you're, you are, you're losing so much weight <laughs> and you're losing so much fat that you're just, you're just stoked on that. But over time, it could take a real toll on not just your lean muscle, which is important for staying active, having a good metabolism, living a long time, but it'll also impact just immediate things like skin, hair, nails, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, you, for people that are wondering and like thinking about this as a visual perspective, we're really good as humans. I was just talking about some another podcast, really good at, as humans are kind of like not thinking about the long term and just saying like, okay, what's happening in the next month, few days, week. But we all see elderly people that are hunched over muscles completely depleted look like skin and bones like you can you see those people but people don't realize that can be you way faster than you think if you don't do these things like that's a great visualization that like, that, like that, you yeah. can be you can be that way earlier on regardless of your age if you let this happen and i think like it, it doesn't mean that doesn't just happen to 60 70 80 year olds like that could happen 40, 50, like it can happen way earlier. So for people who are wondering a visual, if you don't want that to happen, you have to consider this kind of stuff. Yeah, I've absolutely seen people in their 40s that look like they're in their 50s, 60s, late 60s, mm -hmm. because of not thinking about their daily essential amino acid intake through protein or through supplementation. And it's, it's worsened, again, if you do aggressive dieting, whether it's with the support of drugs or without the support of drugs. Ta this so talk to me about this. Say you're going to lose weight, you. Mm-hmm. How many amino acids are you taking a day if you're going to lose weight? And I'm talking, I want you to tell mm -hmm. us in the supplement form and in the powder form. If I want to lose weight, I'm going to take your question. I mean, if I want to lose fat. Okay. Right. So if I want to like get cut, okay. like right now, it's like not a goal for me. Like I'm pretty happy. I'm like mid teen. You look great. I'm mid teen body fat Go percentage. Go watch the but YouTube got... guys, but he's married. <laughs> so sorry. Go yeah. ahead. What, how, uh, how many are you taking? But I was going to say, but I've got like almost a hundred pounds of muscle. Like I'm, I'm more interested in trying to be strong. Okay and fit and like be good at kickboxing, do things like that. But if I was like, man, we're going to Costa Rica in a couple of weeks, like it'd be pretty cool. Like I want to just like look cut, you know? So I, ideally I'd want to lose like 10 pounds of fat. Okay. And if I lost 10 pounds of fat, it would make, it would look significantly different on me. So if I were going to do that, what I need to do is I need to cut about, that's 35,000 calories. Because how many calories do you have? 3,500 calories times, okay. times 10, times 10 pounds. But I want it to be all fat calories. Okay. So and so, and okay. so however, however aggressive I want to be in that, if I want to do that in a week, like 3,500 calories a week for 10 weeks or 7,000 calories. I'm going to call you if I ever need to lose weight. This, yeah. this you, math is like, yeah. I'm like, I'm like, oh my God. What you're saying is you like basically 3,500 calories is basically one pound. Uh, so if you one cut pound 30, of fat, if, if I'm really optimized and I'm going to get to the aminos, if I'm optimizing my protein and my amino acid intake. And so it. for basic math, if someone wants to do, lose one pound in seven days, they could cut 500 calories per day. So yes. just, just so it's okay. Yes. And ideally, if, if you're already, already eating a lot of protein, if you cut 500 calories per day mm -hmm. and then you upped your essential amino acid intake or protein intake, like you ate that much more protein, you would ensure that you're only losing fat and not losing any muscle. Got it. Yeah. So what I would do is honestly, just to be like super safe, I mean, I would like overdo it. I have unlimited amino acid yeah. supply. and <laughs> You're like Charlie in the yeah, chocolate yeah. factory of amino acids. And it's been deemed safe 20 servings per day Got for it? extended use. So that's okay. like a, I mean, that's a lot of servings. I'm going to take some more right now. Yeah. <laughs> I know, God, you're making me want to yeah. just, yeah. just <laughs> take more. That's a lot of servings. So, I mean, I, I, would, I would probably take three servings at a time because one serving, like one serving at a time, which is five grams of essential amino acids. You, if you take that, it's good, it works. But up to three times that amount. So if you take up to three servings at a time, it creates that much more benefit. Okay. So We're doing it right now. The three times the amount is three times as good. 
So I would do that and I would probably do it six times a day. Six times, but so that's But that's six, like a lot. I that's think, six I think, scoops, right? No, that's like three scoops, six times a day. Jeez, wow. But, but, but you don't have to do that but much. I'm telling I think for like, yeah, I'm saying like, I have unlimited, I can do whatever I want to do. And like, I'm really trying to aggressively cut these other calories. Like I want to lose two pounds of fat a week or three pounds of fat a week. Like I, I would do that, but it wouldn't be sustainable for a long time. And for a lot of people, like that's a lot of, it's almost like a clinical dosage amount of essential amino acids. But I think if you take three servings or one to three servings at a time and you take it two to three times a day, you're more than going to surpass that need for the increased amount of essential amino acids. If you're already eating a decent amount of protein in every meal, like if you eat three meals a day and they have a good amount of protein and you're eating some vegetables and you kind of cut out the extra fat dressings, you know, cheap like carbs, et cetera. And that's how you're getting to the lower caloric amount. And then you take the key on aminos, you know, three times a day and you can take it up to three servings at a time. You are going to protect all that muscle and you're going to only lose fat. And you might even put on muscle. Like, so a guy in my office who has been with us for years, but finally got really serious about like macro and calorie counting because he injured his shoulder. He couldn't exercise. For three months, he was really dig- diligent about tracking what he ate every day. And he cut his caloric intake. He did not exercise during this period. Like I can't even emphasize how crazy this is. He didn't exercise. And in three months, he lost 25 pounds of fat and he s- gained net lean muscle because he was taking like three servings of Keanu Aminos like three times a day. Like he was just ensuring that every three hours he was taking, he was getting essential amino acids in his body. He was stimulating new protein synthesis. He was maintaining his muscle. And then he was not overeating, you know, food that would cause him to get fat, like cheap carbs, et cetera. And he was just, and he wasn't like starving himself. He was eating well, but literally 25 pounds of fat, maintained all of his lean muscle, gained a little bit. I think one of the benefits of of some of these Ozempic conversations, and, you know, like, again, it could be a tool, is that for a long time, I, f- I feel that if people in the fitness and health industry said, if you want to lose weight, you got to cut calories. Like that was like, how could you say that? Like, yeah. how could you tell me that I have to stop eating as much as I'm eating? And I think what Ozempic has done is it's opened back up the conversation of, hey, you do this and it makes your appetite suppressed. You're cutting calories essentially in an, maybe in an extreme way, which is giving people, you know, success when it comes to losing fat. Obviously the muscle conversation needs to be there, but I've always personally, again, felt that people overcomplicate this subject, which is if you want to lose fat, that likely involves cutting your caloric intake. Like I don't, it it fundamentally does. Yeah, there's no way. Like there's there's no other way around. Like it's just. But the drug, the drugs can help people to do that if it's if it's really hard. Like if the motivation's hard, if the discipline's hard, if like emotional eating things are tied up with it, like it can it can help. But the reason it works is because it you eat less. Yeah, I mean, but it's you like, got to eat. If you don't eat enough protein, that's the biggest risk of this stuff. You'll long term, you'll be in trouble because you'll eat away not only the fat, you, you'll you'll lose not only the fat, but you'll lose the muscle. Yep. And, and then the face, it doesn't look good. It the does, face, no. especially the face. Mm-hmm. That's what I, that's what I worry about is like the the muscle and the face going away. But again, I know that's weird. When even just like the quality of the skin, I think that like yeah. what people don't get when you think about people getting older. I think that's a great visual. Mm-hmm. As you get older, what happens to your skin? Right, it sags more. Yeah, it gets more dry. Right, it doesn't like the, it doesn't look as like uh, youthful and springy. Tight, and, like, like how it tight looks when you elastic. train, yeah. when you muscle train. It yeah. looks like tight to the skin, yeah. tight to the muscle. And, and the reason for that is because as we get older, our body's not prioritizing rebuilding all those proteins. Right, it's just trying to like survive. Yep. Right, and so. That's why it's so important to think of like in the context of taking a drug like this, where you're depriving yourself of these proteins, you're provoking that same kind of thing in your body. Then your body's not able to prioritize maintaining the quality of your skin because it's just trying to use the protein literally just to help service the rest of your body in terms of energy needs. Whereas if you can get in enough of those essential amino acids, then it can sustain the quality of your skin. And this is one of the things as you get older, starting to supplement with something like Keon Aminos will actually help you maintain more of the tightness of the skin, the quality of the hair of those things, because you're basically counteracting. You're trying to overcome the fact that your body doesn't want to use protein as much for that, right? It's just like, it's not trying to keep your skin as tight. It's not trying to do that. And you're communicating to the body, no, I want it to. I'm giving these essential amino acids because I'm trying to stimulate it to help rebuild the skin to help rebuild older tissues in my vital organs, to help rebuild the muscle. Like you're actually 
uh, communicating to it that you want it to rejuvenate all those proteins? Yeah, I think, you know, it's so we were talking on an episode right before this. And I think sometimes like the bodybuilding community gets shade, obviously, because there's a lot of people that have maybe gone too far in abuse or things. But a lot of these early bodybuilders were on to a lot of things that I think are very relevant, you know, like basically losing fat and putting on muscle in the proper ways to do that. Like a lot, a lot of the supplementation that these guys discovered early on, maybe not to the extreme levels is very relevant. And I think to your point earlier in the episode, some people see, especially maybe women, Lauren used to do this, would see guys like that. I don't want to bulk up. You don't have to go to that extreme. Those guys have to work so hard, but there's certain things and practices they do with it with caloric intake and with supplementation that has been spot on for years and years. I think they've been ahead of the curve in a lot of ways. I, totally. I mean, I think they're, I think specifically for trying to construct your physique, that's like all they do, right? When you think about different types of athletes, bodybuilders, like their whole thing is like, they're trying to construct their physique to look a very specific way. So you don't have to follow all of their advice. Like if you don't want to get jacked, then like, don't do the things that make you get jacked. <laughs> but if you want to control for body fat percentage, like those those men and women have very low body fat percentage and they know how to get there. And it's, I always find it funny though when people say like, you don't want to get, like, yeah, it's like so easy to get jacked. Like, that's what it's you know, so, it's like, you know what it's I mean? hard. It's like, you can't, it's like, whenever, like you, <laughs> whenever I hear like my buddies like, yeah, I'll work out, but I don't want to get jacked. I'm like, what are you talking about, man? Like, you're not going to get jacked working out twice that's a week. That's an for 30 excuse minutes. though. That, that's just an excuse that they're saying. So but like, that's what these guys I think are, it's a resist. I think it's like a, a resistance, resistance to, to execute, to the execute. I really do think so. Cause it's like, I don't, or I don't want to be one of those rich people driving one of those cars. Uh, that's <laughs> an excuse not to execute. I have a random question that. I want to just ask you on air because whenever I post this on my Instagram story, people go wild. So I always post key on coffee on my story. It's what I drink every single day. I've like ran out before and had to like walk down to the local coffee store and it's like disgusting to me. And I'm really didn't even know I was a coffee snob until key on. But I think one of the reasons that I personally like it so much is because it tastes really clean. Mm -hmm. And I know it's one of the only coffees out there that doesn't have mold. Can you speak on why you saw white space there and what actually is in the coffee that we're drinking? Yeah, I love that question. And to even slightly reframe it, it wasn't like there was white space and I wanted to like capture this part of the market. It was, I wanted to drink awesome coffee and I didn't want chemicals in my body or other gross stuff. How hard, <laughs> you drink coffee every day, like how unique that you would want great coffee. Yeah, so I think the, what happened, like I'll describe what we do to ensure the, the coffee is of the quality that it is. And you'll, you'll, it'll paint the picture of what's not happening in other coffees maybe you drink. Okay. So the first thing is when you go and you source the green beans, you basically are able to source whether it's like specialty grade or not. And specialty grade is the quality of the actual green beans, like uh, size, if they're similar or not, if they're broken, et cetera. And the more attention that's put into the actual farming of those beans, will determine whether it's specialty grade or not. And I think it's, it's less than like five or 3% of all coffee in the world okay. is, is specialty grade. Um, after that, then it's, well, is it organic certified? And organic certified is, you know, third party certification that actually certifies at the level of like the farm to see if they're using any chemicals on the farm or not. Um, then after that, it's really about like, well, who's raising the coffee and what conditions. And then finally, once the coffee gets actually like grown and gets put, uh, into a drying situation, how is it dried? So coffee literally, as you can imagine, I mean, it's grown in places that don't have tons of money. In some cases, it's just beans are just laid out all over the ground, right? Or laid out in these large drying situations, or you can use a mechanical dryer. So we specifically buy coffee that is all specialty grade, organic from very select farms that make the highest quality coffee and then only use the machine machine drying process. The machine drying process ensures that you don't just have wet coffee beans sitting there and then could potentially grow mold on them. So it's really like an operational thing that you have to uh, qualify a farm for besides just like test for later. Then once the coffee beans are actually, you know, grown and dried, then they have to pack them into some type of bag. Something that we learned early on is that you can get a certified organic coffee bean that actually gets put into a green coffee bag. Have you seen those big coffee sacks? Yeah. Sure. You know what I'm talking about? But that was used for a non-organic coffee 
previously. So it's got pesticides all over it. Oh. So if you actually were to test that same coffee, which we had done before, and it had pesticides on it, we're like, why is this coffee a pesticide? It's supposedly organic. And they had to track it down because we were so neurotic about making sure it was like the perfect coffee. And they're like, oh, I guess it's from these sacks. We didn't even know. And I mean, like, we're like, I'm pretty new to the coffee business, like 2017. So it meant like organic coffees for a long time until we had asked Ugh. people, <laughs> you, they could be packed in a bag that's like got pesticides all over it. So your bags are clean now too. That yeah. Packing. Well, yeah. I mean, we've never sold a coffee that has had that situation. So we uncovered it in it. testing because we're, te we're testing at the green bean level. We're testing once it's been stored, we're testing again, uh, you know, upon final production for things like pesticides, cleaning chemicals. Cause also like, even when you're like roasting the coffee on machines, there's the risk that someone cleans the machine with some kind of like chemical. Right. And then the, like a cleaning, I mean, just think about like a cleaning solution. Like if you don't hire the right cleaning company to clean the, the roasting machine. Oh. So we've just been like very specific and neurotic at every stage to make sure it's specially grade, organ organic, machine dried, that the testing occurs for pesticides and other chemicals, mold, et cetera, at the green bean level, at the storage level, and then at the finished testing level um, to where you're just, you're getting, there's no chance of it not, you know, it's like we've, we've minimized all the risk of their getting exposure to any of these gross things. So how many cups do you have a day? I'm cutting back right now. Okay. So I have cut back from like five. Oh, geez. To like two or three. Yeah. So See, it's good there. coffee. Like it's yeah. weird. Like your coffee's clean though. And I, it yeah, is good coffee. I can do two cups of yours, <laughs> dull sensitive and be fine. But like, that's all. I, I get jittery if I do more than a cup and a half, but if I could and it didn't make me like coffee in general jittery, I would do three. I the, get it. The jittery thing is probably like the biggest, um, that's the biggest difference that people notice. Like that, that's like the, like I can tell you all the stuff about how it's clean and it's tested for all these things. But when you drink, drink it, it is really remarkable how much less jitters you get from another coffee. I could not drink that much coffee. It's funny. So huh. similarly, sometimes I'm out and I'm like, I want to get a coffee and I'll go to the local coffee shop. And I, it's like a good roaster in Boulder and they're nice people. It's organic. I get it. And like literally one cup and I'm kind of like, like well, I'm like, also, can I just go off? Cause I feel like you'll appreciate this. Do you get this beautiful organic coffee at the coffee store, but then you get it in a cup that has plastic lined in it yeah. with the plastic lid and the microplastics all melt in it. And then you're drinking microplastics. Like it's just like on and on and on and on and on, you know? Yeah, yeah I get it in the ceramic mug. Oh, oh excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Look at this if one I, upper, you know, Also, Lauren, mug. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to one up you too. If I ever go to a coffee shop, I always get a, just an iced Americano because I don't trust being in that either. Yeah, but just, you're getting it in a plastic cup. Uh, so yeah, Angela still cup. wins. But at least it's not melting. <laughs> yeah, but you, you get the straw. See, yep. I actually, uh, sorry guys, I actually have silicone straws that I bring places. So um, while you guys are drinking out of your weird uh, microplastic, I'm drinking my silicone straw. I transfer it into a clay jar that I've made by hand. <laughs> okay, can we do a huge giveaway of all of our favorites? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, guys, go follow at Keon on Instagram. I really, really, really love their coffee, the mango aminos. And I'm really into these supplements. That's because this is an easy way to get them. You can just take them. The capsules. The capsules. capsules. Yeah. But but every single day without fail, and you guys have seen this for the last two years, I take a scoop of the mango aminos with a scoop of the creatine. I froth it up in my ceramic mug with no lead. And I drink it during a workout. So definitely try that. And then I also like the mango travel packets because I travel a lot and it's easy to just throw in my carry on. Where can everyone find you? What's Is there a code to shop? I think the best place to go to is just uh, get Keon, G-E-T-K-I-O-N.com okay. slash skinny. Okay. And everything we've talked about should be on there. And that should be 20% off. 20% off. Thank that you. is so generous. I feel like you can come back anytime because there truly is so many different layers. It's like an octopus. I'm not quite sure what tentacle to go to. <laughs> I liked, I've never heard that one. I thought, I thought you were going to, when you started with O, I thought it was going to be onion. No. And it was octopus. Yeah. 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 You're an octopus. I'm an octopus. She's yeah. unique. So two, two <laughs> tentacles thus far. Octopus. There's six left. Yeah. we've There's six yeah. left. So yeah. you mm -hmm. can come. I actually have so many more questions about health and wellness, but that's all the time we have for today. So at Keon on Instagram, you guys at getkeon.com slash skinny. Check out Mango Aminos, 20% off. That is very generous. Angelo, can we go stalk you on Instagram or are you private? What's in your bio? I, I have to go check what's in my bio. Does it say Amino Guy? You know what's funny is they literally call me Amino Keely at work. Like that's my nickname. Love it. <laughs> it yeah. So 
I'm not private. You can, if you if you work hard enough, you can find me. Okay. Oh. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. You're the best.